Testing place. And would you stand please everyone? Together let us sing all four verses of hymn number 150. found a resting place not in device or creed I trust the ever-living one is wounds for me shall plead I need no other argument I need no other This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough. Salvation through His blood. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. Physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. <coughs> Please remain standing for morning prayer. Well, amen. Very good. It's good to see you here this morning. God bless you for being here. Looking forward to a great service here in the Lord. And we praise the Lord for what He's done for us. Pray for these uh, ladies that will be traveling back. They had a good time at their ladies' conference on yesterday, and they're traveling back after the morning service there in Connecticut, traveling back this way. Pray for them as they'll be traveling through some rain from the impending storm of the century right that's coming this way and uh but uh praise the lord we know who creates the storms and who calms the storms and uh saying preacher are you saying just be flipping about it no i'm not saying be flipping about it but uh i'm glad we don't have to go into mass hysteria you know like everybody else does and uh we know who controls the weather we praise god for it and uh we look forward to what the lord has for us in this hour i'm excited about it and excited about this time. I just talked to Brother Geisman just about an hour ago, and he's looking forward to being here this evening. And so we're uh, pressing on, and I want to encourage you to be here and be a part of it all. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to be here and be in your house this morning. I thank you for your people who've gathered here. Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct and bless now. Uh, Lord, and through every part of this service, uh, from these opening hymns, thank you that our faith has found a resting place in Thee. And Lord Jesus, I pray that as we have opportunity again in just a moment to lift our voices, may we lift them in praise and worship uh, to You. Lord, we do pray for uh, the ladies who will be traveling back from Connecticut this afternoon. Pray that You give them safety, watch over, protect them. Uh, Lord, through the rain, 
uh, as they'll be journeying back. I pray that all will run smoothly with the vehicle, and Lord, I pray that you would uh, uh, just guide and direct them safely back here to us. We do pray, uh, Lord, that you would uh, speak to hearts through the message this morning. Lord, I pray our hearts will be open, receptive, ready to hear. And uh, Lord, help us to be faithful in our giving and our tithes and our offerings. I pray that you take it, multiply it, and use it for the furtherance of the gospel here in this place and around the world. We thank you for what you've done for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remain standing, Brother Bob's come back to lead us in another hymn. Hymn number 178, Jesus Loves Even Me. And together let us sing all three verses of hymn, hymn number 178. <clears throat> I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Can you play that through just a little bit there? Greet some of their next day. Tell me you're glad to see them here this morning. Very good. As you make your way back to your seat there, you can just have a seat. And uh, I'll share a couple announcements with you. Thanks, Brother Bob. It's a good thing that everybody fellowships together. That's great. goes quiet, everybody will pay attention to me.
You know what this means, right? I can preach till one o'clock as long as you talk. So. I'll get everybody sitting down, right? <laughs> uh, very, very good. Well, if you have a bulletin there, if you take it out and look at it with me. Gentlemen, if you come while I'm talking, that'll be great. If you're visiting with us today, God bless you for being here. And these men want to put a packet of information in your hand. If you'll raise your hand as they make their way back to you. They'll put this packet in your hand. There's a card on the inside. If you'd fill it out, leave it with us in the offering plate. We'll have a record of your visit. And God bless you for being here at Calvary Independent Baptist Church. I appreciate Mrs. Spangler helping us out with the piano today and uh, keeping it in the family. Praise the Lord. That's, and uh, I guess we should say she kept it in the family, right? And uh, well, we praise the Lord for helping us out with that, doing a great job. Thank you so much. If you look there at the bulletin, some announcements we want to make. Brother Brian Geesman, of course, we've told you about this for several weeks. He's planning on being here to update us concerning the ministry at Eagle Ranch. And uh, as I said, I just spoke with him just a little while ago. And you pray for him as he comes, and the Lord would use him uh, to speak to our hearts tonight. Uh, we'll have monthly fellowship. We'll celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. And you see what to bring corresponding with the letter of your last name there. And uh, that's right there given for you. And I trust you'll make plans to be back this evening. Next Sunday is World Mission Sunday. I've asked Pastor Dave Landers and uh, his wife, uh, Judy, they're going to be our guests. And Pastor Landers will be preaching in the morning service and in the evening service on next Sunday. And he pastors the Gateway Baptist Church just down the road here in Rising Sun. For years, uh, Brother Landers was a missionary in the country of Bolivia in South America. And the Lord led him back here to the States. And now he works with Worldwide New Testament Baptist Missions. And uh, we read the letter this morning from Brother Joel Dickens, one of our newest missionaries. And Brother Joel, who's been on the field of Brazil now going on seven years, and uh, he was home on furlough for just a little bit this past year, about six months, and now he's back in Brazil. Uh, but he's with Worldwide New Testament Baptist Missions. And then, of course, we support Brother Edgar Figali, and I think many of, our, many of you know Brother Edgar, serving over in the Middle East, and he is also works with Worldwide. And uh, Pastor Landers is on the board of Worldwide New Testament Baptist Missions, so he knows a little bit, a little something about missions work and uh, serving on a foreign field, and I've asked him to come and be with us on next Sunday. So I want to encourage you to be here all the way through on next Sunday. Next Saturday evening... As a special evening we have planned, and I want to encourage you to be there for that as well, and uh, have some updates from some of our missionaries, Brother DeLong and uh, Brother Cassidy, Brother DeLong, of course, in Australia, Brother Cassidy in Malawi, in Africa, and uh, they've sent us uh, some videos uh, of the work and update there, so I'm looking forward to that. Brother DeLong's actually going to be with us on next year, about a year from now. And looking forward to having him here with us uh, when he's on furlough next year. And, uh, but uh, we'll show those videos. Then I have a special video I want to show you as well uh, concerning the work of God worldwide. And I trust you'll make plans to be here 6 o'clock uh, Saturday evening. And then the teenagers are going to provide uh, some babysitting for all of you uh, folks who have children, small children. Or maybe you're caring for grandchildren, whatever the case may be. And uh, that'll be Friday the 9th. That's a week from this Friday, from 5.30 to 9.30. And uh, they'll go feed them. They'll go have things to do with them. And uh, so uh, you see there, uh, if you have infants all the way up through sixth graders, they're welcome to be a part of that. And uh, if you're wondering, is there going to be any adults here at all? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, Brother Scott and Carrie are going to be here. And uh, they're going to head up the melee and everything that's going on. So uh, you, uh, if you want to take advantage of that, there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby uh, for that. That's a week from Friday. That's November the 9th. Some upcoming events. Uh, the fall congregational meeting will be Wednesday evening. Uh, men will have prayer breakfast on Saturday morning. That will be at 8 a.m. That's not listed there. Maybe you want to write that in so you don't forget about it. There will be prayer breakfast this Saturday, 8 a.m. And uh, then board members, we need to meet together at about 5.30 this evening for just a few moments. 5.30, if you'll plan on being here, we'll meet for just, just a few moments. And then also this evening, in preparation for the congregational meeting, we'll have the financial report available for you if you'd like to pick one of those up 
uh, this evening at the service. I encourage you to do so. If you look on the back, some prayer requests that are listed here, and uh, you see health uh, needs here, and many that are listed, many of our shut-ins here. And let me ask you to add Hazel Prang, and she's in the hospital, and uh, she was having a procedure done this morning for a uh, bleeding ulcer. So do be praying for Hazel. I know Park and the rest of the family would appreciate that at this time. And then our shed of the week is uh, Bill Hogue and his address and information are given for you there. If you can send him a note or call him, I know that'd be a great encouragement to him. You see our attendance and our offering totals from last Sunday given there for you. Our missionary of the week, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the Dickens uh, serving over in Brazil and be praying for that family. And then opportunities throughout the week. And uh, we'll see. Some of you may be concerned about tomorrow evening and the School of the Bible. And uh, I'm going to meet with you just for a few moments tonight after the service. And we'll talk about uh, what may happen or may not happen there concerning the, the weather and everything that's going on. And uh, so if I can meet with you, you're involved in that. 7 o'clock uh, tomorrow night. Meet me after the service tonight for just a few moments and before fellowship, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Other things that are going on, of course, the evening service, I think we'll be fine this evening, and that's at 6.30, and then Wednesday night at 7, and uh, all the different activities going on, King's Kids, Proteins, and then soul winning and visitation, we have a, a uh, praise, praise the Lord, this is two weeks in a row. Uh, we had a young lady come to Christ yesterday uh, on soul winning and visitation, and... Uh, Brother Smith and I had been there earlier, and then Brother Smith and Brother Crider went back yesterday and uh, able to lead her to Christ. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Her name is Tiffany. So be praying for Tiffany. And uh, that's a great thing. And Brother Smith said she was, she was ready. The Lord had prepared her. And uh, God works in the hearts of people, you know, before you ever get there. And uh, there's people who, sometimes people say, and I can't believe people receive the gospel the first time they ever hear it, but you don't know what the Lord's doing in their heart before they heard it for the first time. I told you the story about the young man from China that was in Tennessee. And the first time somebody presented the gospel to him, he got saved. But God had already worked in his heart, and I gave you a little bit of that story before. And uh, there's many others like that. And uh, praise the Lord for it, what he's doing. If you haven't picked up a Faith Promise Commitment card, let me encourage you to do so. We'd like to have all these turned in by our special meal that we have at Thanksgiving time, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's the 14th, November the 14th. And we'd like to have all those turned in by then so we can give you an estimate of what uh, that is going to be for the year. And uh, are the missionary cards, I didn't look on the way in, are they still out there? Does anybody know? Anybody help me with that? Everybody's looking at me blank-faced, you know. And uh, they're still there. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. And uh, so if you haven't signed those, let me encourage you to do that. They're out there and available for you. I try to look before I come in. Sometimes it doesn't always work that way. Gentlemen, if you'll come, we'll be ready to receive our offering here this morning. And I trust you'll give and give faithfully. The Baptist bread and the glow-in-the-dark for November and December are out there and available for you. And November begins Thursday. It's hard to believe, but it does. And uh, so you want to pick one of those up. And uh, also there's a nice thank you note here. I'm not going to take the time to read it all from Brother Smith, Brother Preston Smith and his wife, Aby, who were with us last Sunday. And I'll leave that out in the missions table. You can read that uh, at your leisure. Brother Dick Carter, would you lead us in our prayer, please, sir? Amen.
take your hymnals once again, please, and turn to hymn number 109, Savior, Like a Shepherd Lead Us. And would you stand, please, everyone, together, let us sing all four verses of hymn number 109. take God's word and turn it with me, the gospel of Luke, the gospel of Luke in the 19th chapter, Luke chapter 19, and we're going to read but one verse here uh, this morning from the word of God, Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse number 10, Uh, five times in the New Testament we have a command uh, that was given by the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what we are called this month, and really extending into next month just a little bit, uh, what we have called a missions emphasis that we're placing. We'd have several of our own missionaries, a couple of them, Brother Nunez, Brother Giesman tonight, a couple other new missionaries that have come in over the last several weeks. 
And we want to place this emphasis here. And the great emphasis of that command is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19, and that is to teach all nations. That carries the idea of discipling. That is the idea of evangelism by multiplication. Not just addition, but multiplication. And how is that carried out? The apostle Paul told Timothy, The things that thou hast learned of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able, the Bible says in verse number 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, to teach others also. And so whenever we come to a time such as this, whether it be a morning service, whether it be a Sunday school hour, whether it be an evening service, whether it be a prayer meeting, whether it be a special meeting of some sort, whether it be our own personal time that I trust every one of us have each day in God's Word. We come to a time like that and we study the Word of God, we read the Word of God, we meditate on God's Word. It is obviously for our soul's edification to draw us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it should not stop there. We all have a responsibility to take what we have received and to give it out. If you see that pattern all the way through the New Testament. You find out that when people received truth, they gave the truth out. They didn't just keep it to themselves, but they gave it out. And when you see that, you also see that throughout the New Testament that there is a passion, there is a zeal, uh, that these believers had to take the truth and to give it to others. Now, I believe it ought to be our passion to do the same thing. We ought to have that same desire to take what we've received and to give it out to other people. Notice what the Lord Jesus Christ said in the setting of Luke chapter 19. The first few verses here is the salvation of Zacchaeus. We know the story of Zacchaeus. We know he was a publican. Uh, we know that the Jews hated the publicans because the publicans were tax collectors. And they not only took what Rome asked them to take, but they also padded their own pockets. And that's what Zacchaeus had done. And so the people hated Zacchaeus. They didn't, really, they, they didn't like the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ went to Zacchaeus' house. We know the story. Our young people, our children know the story well. They know the song about we little Zacchaeus, you know. But the fact of the matter is that we find out that Zacchaeus becomes a believer and it is evident because of the change in his behavior and what he does. And then the Bible gives us this tenth verse here. It says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. We probably have memorized this verse somewhere along life's journey. Those of us who know the Lord have known the Lord for any length of time. And we think about what this verse states. That the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It was the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ to see people come to know Him. To receive Him as Savior. Everything worthwhile in life is the result of someone's passion for that thing. Someone's striving, someone's desire. And our consuming passion as a Christian ought to be that we take what we have received, this great salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we proclaim it from the housetops, we proclaim it from the mountaintops, that we take it to the ends of the earth. That's the responsibility we have. Now, in this day and this time, there's no doubt about the fact that it seems as though the world has sharp has, has dulled our sharpness. It's thrown a wet, wet blanket on our enthusiasm. Uh, the fire, the, the passion, the zeal that we had when we first came to know Christ as Savior, it seems like in many people that it's gone out. And we look at what's going on around us, we look at our world, we look at the situation we're in as a nation, and we think as if, and we live as if, even though we would never say it maybe out of our lips, that it's too far gone for anything more to happen, that we just, that we just I really believe that 
it seems as though in the New Testament church in many areas and New Testament believers in many areas, it seems as if they have that mentality of, I'm just going to hold on. Well, look, dear friend, we ought to be doing more than hold on. God has given us a command to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, and He's given us all power, and He's promised His presence. Praise God, within two weeks now, we've seen two young people, both of the people, the young man we saw last Saturday and the young lady they saw yesterday come to know Christ as Savior, young people. And sometimes we get the idea, we think, well, well, preacher, if they got saved, blessed be God, where are they? Well, let me tell you, when you were born, no one said, blessed be God, why don't you eat that steak over on the table, you know? Well, you didn't have teeth to eat it, first of all. You couldn't even lift your head up with somebody helping you get your head up. So what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say, look, these people who just come to know the Lord, they're going to have to get somebody in there to encourage them and to help them, to disciple them, to bring them along. Hey, if any man be in Christ, yes, he is a new creature, uh, but they're going to need some help. They're going to need some encouragement. They're going to need some strength. Uh, you see, the, the norm today, the norm is not to let Christianity disrupt my lifestyle. That's the way many Christians live. Look, if it doesn't throw a kink in my schedule, I'll do it. If it doesn't, uh, you know, if it doesn't bother my plan and my scheme, then hey, I'll be involved. But if it if it bothers something that I, I'm going to do, then I'm not really, you know, hey, uh, you know, somebody else can do it. And somebody else can take care of it. You know, I wonder why isn't this command that Christ gave, why isn't this, this, this central thing of taking the lost uh, or taking the gospel to the lost why isn't the central function of the local church? It should be. It should be. Look, the church shouldn't be some activity center or some, some, uh, some social hall where we just all come together. Praise God for fellowship. I enjoy fellowship times that we have. I'll enjoy it tonight. I like stuff made with pumpkin. I'm looking forward to that. But the truth of the matter is this. That's not the chief end of the local church. The chief end is to bring glory to God. In order to do that, in order to do that, we are supposed to obey Him and live a life that's pleasing to Him. And that means obeying this last command that He left us to do. The great task is still ahead of us. And I think about down throughout history, I think about valiant men and valiant women who had a passion for the holiness of God, and they had a passion for evangelizing the lost. Will you bear with me for just a moment? I want to give you just a couple of illustrations. There's a man by the name of Robert Murray McShane. Some of you have probably heard of him. He's one of Scotland's greatest preachers. He died when he was 29. 29 years old. A biographer wrote about McShane that everywhere he stepped, Scotland shook. Everywhere he stepped. Whenever he opened his mouth, it was said that a spiritual force seemed to sweep in every direction. Thousands, thousands came to know Christ through his ministry. There was a man, a traveler, who was eager to see where McShane had preached, and so he went to the church where McShane had preached. And as he got there, the, the sexton, the fellow that took care of the grounds, agreed to give him a tour, and he led the way to McShane's study there in the church. The old sexton told the young man, he said, sit there, sit there in that chair. The traveler, he kind of hesitated for just a moment, then he sat in the chair. On the table uh, there before him on the desk was an open Bible. The traveler, the young man, he had a great desire uh, when he came there. He wanted to know the same power and, 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 and the same uh, 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 results that McShane saw from his preaching. And so he went there and he talked to the old sexton. He said, look, you know, I, I've read stories about McShane. I've read stories about how people came to Christ through his preaching and, and how it, it, he just had a, had, a, had a wonderful effect on people through here through the power of God. I'd like to have that same power. So the sexton said, I want you to sit there in that chair. So he went over and he sat down in that chair there was that Bible open before him. And then the sexton said this. He said, I want you to drop your head in that book and weep. Because before our preacher ever went to that pulpit, that's what he did. He dropped his face in the Bible. And he wept before God. He begged God. He pleaded God to do what only God could do. 
He then led the young man out into the sanctuary and up to where the pulpit was. There on the pulpit again was another open Bible there on the pulpit. He looked at him and he said, I want you to stand there. Stand behind that pulpit. Drop your head and hands and let the tears flow because before our preacher ever came to the pulpit, that's what he would do. I tell you this morning, you know what we lack? I really believe what we lack. We lack, as I mentioned to you a few weeks ago, we lack the tears that we need to have. We lack. You know, the Bible talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times we find Jesus throughout the Word of God. And what do we find Him doing? We find Him in sorrow of heart. We find Him crying out to His Father. We find Him having deep compassion for those who were, as He said in Matthew 23, who were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And he wept. You remember in Matthew chapter 16 when he asked that question, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? You remember, he said, Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're Jeremiah. Why would they compare the Lord Jesus Christ to Jeremiah? Because what was Jeremiah known as? He was known as the weeping prophet. And I believe when they saw the tears that the Lord Jesus Christ shed, they said, This has to be Jeremiah. No one has wept as much as Jeremiah wept as this man. McShane had such a passion for souls and a passion for God's Word. Is it any wonder that the Holy Spirit used him in such a way to draw thousands to Christ? It was said of John Knox that his yearning for souls was so great when he preached, it was thought that his pulpit would break in pieces. John Wesley is said to have done more for England than her armies and navies ever did. He lived very meagerly, giving away thousands of dollars in his lifetime. Throughout his ministry, he was abused, he was maligned, but he left all that in the hands of God. He left his reputation in God's hands. It's been estimated that Wesley traveled some 225,000 miles on foot and horseback and preached some 2,400 sermons. Much of the established church, the denominational church of his day, they they hated him. But he brought fire into the pulpits and into the cold hearts of people. A man by the name of George Whitfield was ordained at age 22 and he began preaching with such power and such eloquence and effect. John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, said, he said, this has got to be the greatest preacher of our day. It was said about Whitfield that he could stand in an open field and he could be heard for miles around. That was before a PA was ever invented. It speaks so clearly. His power came from a passion for souls. He, he used every God-given ability to lead men to Jesus Christ. He, he once wrote this. He said, if his life was in danger of nestling down, God, out of pity, should place a thorn in his nest. That would be a good prayer for us, wouldn't it? God place a thorn in my nest. It was said he crossed the Atlantic 13 times. He preached thousands of sermons. His gravestone reads that he was a soldier of the cross, humble, devout, ardent, preferring the honor of Christ to his own interest, reputation, or life. And we could go on and on and on. We could talk about Borden of Yale who gave up that inheritance of the Borden Milk Company and he went, his desire was to go to India, but he never made it to India. Just a young man. He is well in his 20s and... He died in Egypt before he ever got to India with the gospel. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. You've probably heard those. We could talk of Jim Elliott. We could talk of so many others who willingly gave of themselves with such a passion for souls. And I read those stories and I read those biographies. And by the way, you ought to read those biographies. You ought to read them. Say, preacher, I'm not much of a reader. Well, you ought, to, you ought to make yourself read them. If it takes you years, you ought to make yourself read them. Why? Because their, their testimonies will challenge you. You think you're having a hard time, you pick up to the Golden Shore and you read the life story of Adoniram Judson. If you think you're having a difficult time, you, you pick that up and you read about his life. Six years in Burma, six years in Burma before he saw one person come to Christ. Six years. 
It took him over a year, over a year from England to get to Burma. Over a year. Now you think about that. Think about what we complain about. Trivial, isn't it? Trivial. Meaningless. Now the perfect example is the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the perfect example of a passion for lost men and lost women. I want you to think about a couple things this morning. First of all, I want you to think about the witness of Christ's forerunner. I want you to think about the witness of Christ's forerunner. And all this is going to lead into where we're headed. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Christ had such a passion. His forerunner was a testimony to the passion that he had for souls. His forerunner was what we call a witness, a soul winner. Matthew chapter 3, who was his forerunner? Well, it was a man by the name of John the Baptist, right? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And what was John's message? And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. His message was what? His message was repentance. That was the call for people to turn from their sin, uh, uh, to turn towards the Lord. He wore rough clothing. He ate wild food. Nothing about his form uh, nothing about uh, 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 his outward appearance. Nothing about it was attractive. But he had an attractiveness that we need. He had the attractiveness of Jesus Christ upon his life. Boy, we need the attractiveness of Jesus Christ. John's message was a message of repentance. What was John's method? Well, look at verse number 7. John's method, the Bible says, When we saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O oh, generation of vipers! Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid in the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat in the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Hey, by the way, what was John's method? I think John only knew one method. John's method was the direct method. He was direct. John didn't mince any words. John didn't pussyfoot around the issue or patty cake around it either. He said, this is what God has said. Now, do I think that John was mean and ugly-spirited about it? No, I don't think so. But I do know this. John was urgent about it. John was urgent about that. I wonder today, where are the thundering witnesses that we need? Listen, do we expect, do we expect others who don't have the truth to share the truth with those who need it? They can't. They can't do it. Why? They don't have it. Do you have it? Do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? Then you are a witness. And the only ones who can witness are witnesses. And so we have a responsibility to take what we've received to the ends of the earth, and that begins right here. That begins right here. I wonder where's the passion Where's the passion for evangelism today? The Bible says in John 5.35 about John, he was a burning and a shining light. Jesus' forerunner was a fiery witness which tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ had a passion for the lost. He sent forth uh, uh, that one who was going to go before him to prepare the way. And the message that that one who was going before him to prepare the way had was repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you and I have a similar responsibility because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. And we have a responsibility to tell this entire world beginning with our own little community and our street and our neighbors that Jesus Christ is coming again. No, I know, I know, I know what kind of day we live in. I know. 
We live in a polarized day. We live in a day when man didn't want to hear anything about it. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Well, we're living there, right? No doubt about it. Listen, does this, does this message still have the same power? Certainly it does. What's wrong then? Has this, has this book lost any power? No, friends, this book hasn't lost any power. The truth of the matter is, nothing's wrong with the message, it's the messengers. It's the messengers. Christ's forerunner was a witness. Christ Himself, number two, was a witness. Look over just, just one chapter, Matthew chapter 4. Christ Himself was a, myth, was a, was a witness. What, did, what was Christ's message while He was on this earth? Well, look at verse number 17, Matthew chapter 4. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, that sounds like the same message John had. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was he preaching about? He was preaching about coming judgment. He was preaching about confession of sin. He was preaching about repentance. He goes into the cities. He goes into the villages. He goes into the synagogue. And what do we find him do? We find him witnessing to others. We find him evangelizing other people. The Bible says in Matthew 9, 35, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He was preaching the good news about himself that God was providing a Savior and the Savior had come and he was standing in their midst. Why don't you look with me Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28. Christ gives this great invitation. And He gives it to those who have been under the bondage of religious traditions. The Pharisees and scribes have laid all that upon the people. And He says, Come unto Me. Come, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I want you to think about that. He says, You come, I'll give you rest. Last night I sat down. I took care of it. You all know that these other guys, they can feel sympathy with me. Where are they at? Kent over there and Aaron and Scott's over here. Anybody else? Kevin? You're old enough now, though. They take care of themselves, right? But I got everybody fed, bathed. We had devotions. We prayed and sent them all to bed. And I turned the football game on. And I promptly fell asleep. Helps us appreciate our wives more, right, man? The truth of the matter is, though, I was tired. I was tired. No doubt about it. I was wore out. I was glad just to rest. I could care less really what was going on in the football game anyway. My mother used to say that my dad, he'd just turn them on sometimes just for background noise to sleep by. You know, that was all it was. It was going... But I was tired. I just wanted to rest. I just wanted to sit down and rest. Jesus said, come, come. You, you want rest? You, you come unto me. Are you, hey, look, are you, are you heavy laden? You, you're laboring? You're laboring trying to do it all yourself? You're heavy laden? This yoke that they've put upon you? Jesus says, look, you, you come unto me. You come unto me. Now notice verse number 29. Take my yoke upon you. Whoa, 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 whoa. I thought you said rest. Now you say yoke? Well, what do you think of yoke? You think of work. A yoke of oxen. Work. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Jesus says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find what? Rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now, let me be very specific here. Jesus wasn't talking about the fact that you have to somehow labor to get into heaven. That's not what He's talking about. But what He is talking about is this, that once we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, we become a bond slave of Jesus Christ, and we are to work for Him. But His work is easy. His burden is light. There is a laboring rest that we are to enter into. 
There is a laboring rest. There is a rest, there is a peace, there is a satisfaction found in laboring for Jesus Christ that's not found anywhere else. Nowhere else. He said, come unto me. He said, I'll take the heavy burdens. I'll take the labor. Learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden. My burden is light. Christ gave that invitation. Jesus says, I want you to turn from relying on yourself, relying on your, your religious works. I want, you to, I want you to come to me, take on my yoke, for it's easy. Christ repeatedly called for people to come to Him in faith. Look over in the Gospel of John with me for just a minute. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse number 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God. What? That ye believe on Him whom He hath sent. He said, you want to do the work of God? Come to me. Place your faith in me. Look at verse number 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Look at verse number 50. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Who's he talking about? He is talking about himself. Look at chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse number 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Look at chapter 8, verse number 12. Chapter 8, verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. One more, chapter 10, verse number 11. Chapter 10, verse number 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd as opposed to the hireling that he talked about earlier in that passage. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. What's Jesus doing? Constantly he's telling men, believe on me, receive me, trust me, place your faith in me, come to me. That's what he's saying. He's pointing people to himself. What's he doing? He is being a witness he is being a witness. What about personally? You know, he personally, he called out to the multitudes. He called out to the crowds. But he personally dealt with people too, didn't he? He personally did. Look back in John chapter 1 for just a moment. John chapter 1, verse number 43. Earlier in the chapter, we find him calling out to Andrew. Andrew was one of John's disciples. and Andrew comes to Christ. He follows him in verse number 40. And the first thing Andrew does is he goes and he finds his own brother, Simon. That's Peter. And he brought him to Jesus. What's Jesus doing? Well, he's still he's calling out. He says in verse number 43, The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Aren't you glad there was a day when your name could be put there, the Lord Jesus found... I'm glad there was a day that I can say there's a, that the Lord Jesus found Daniel. Hey, yesterday the Lord Jesus found... He found Timothy. Or Tiffany, I mean. Tiffany. Last week, the Lord Jesus found a young man by the name of Adam. Well, that's a great thing. Hey, you know what? God was preparing their hearts to come to know Him as Savior. And they received the truth of that message. Jesus Christ has a, he has a personal witness. He called Matthew in Matthew 9. He calls Peter and Andrew in Matthew chapter 4 uh, uh, with that simple call, follow me. John chapter 4, you remember that woman uh, that was at the well, that Samaritan woman. Jesus called out to her. She came to know Him. Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? She testified of. Luke chapter 19 found a man by the name of Zacchaeus. John chapter 3, found a man by the name of Nicodemus. Mark chapter 10, blind Bartimaeus. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Called out to him and Jesus found him there. Mark chapter 5, we find a demon-possessed man. Actually, there were two of them. One rejected and one received as far as we can tell, as far as we know. He lived in that area of Gadara. The Bible says 
that he came to Christ. And he was sitting clothed in his right mind. And when Jesus was asked to leave the city of Gadara and go back across the Galilee, you know what that maniac wanted to do? He wanted to do what? He wanted to go with Jesus. Every time I think about that and read that, I think about what is my, what is my heart's desire? What is my passion? Is it to be with Jesus or is it to serve myself? That man said, look, I want to go with you. But Jesus said, look, there's a greater work for you to do. The greatest work you have to do is go home. You go home, you tell your friends and you tell your family. And the Bible says uh, that from his testimony, all those in Decapolis, ten cities, heard. Why? Because of that man's testimony. Do you think that one man one man changed with the power of the gospel can make an effect on an entire area. I submit to you they can. And they should. Jesus was a personal witness. What can we take away from the witness of Jesus Christ for our own lives? Well, uh, uh, what, what can we use? First of all, I want you to notice this. Maybe you want to write these down somewhere. Jesus Christ was available. He was available. Oh, there were times of retreat. There were times when uh, he, he went apart. He was regularly among the people. He even took times, even though he was busy. That ought to resonate with us, right? I'm busy. I'm busy. Great, all of us are. We're all busy in our own little area, in our own little realm. Jesus was busy but he took time out of his busy schedule to point people to him. Hey, he wasn't, he wasn't partial. Uh, Jesus went with the lepers. He went with the common folk. Jesus, he talked to the prostitutes and the tax collectors. Those belonging to the, to the lower social classes, whether it be social, whether it be moral, whatever the case may be, Jesus spoke to them. He helped a, a, a man of high esteem, uh, a centurion, uh, a man of dignity and stature. Uh, uh, he ministered to a wealthy man by the name of Jairus, and his daughter was raised back to life. Uh, uh, Jesus reflected the mind of God because the Bible says He was no respecter of persons. When's the last time, when's the last time we tried to witness to somebody who we didn't like? When's the last time we went to an area and began to try uh, to witness to someone who we didn't care for them, we didn't care for their lifestyle? Hey, look, we can shout it out. We can shout out from the mountaintops how much we despise lifestyles of evil people. But what are we doing to reach them? What good is it going to be if they live this life in darkness and die and go to hell? When you and I had the truth. Jesus wasn't partial. He wasn't partial. Jesus was sensitive. He was sensitive. He was sensitive to the, to the pain of a sinner. In Mark chapter 5, when He did cross over the sea, when He went, uh, when he left Gadara, uh, and He went back over the sea, and He got over there, uh, and He was on His way to, to Jairus' house. You remember what happened on His way to Jairus' house? There were crowds of people, multitudes of people were thronging Him, and there was a woman there who had an issue of blood uh, uh, for 12 years, and she tried to get as close as she possibly could through the press, and she touched but the hem of His garment. Remember her? Jesus was sensitive to that because when that happened, He immediately stopped and He said, Who touched me? And Peter looked at Him and said, What do you mean who touched you? All these people are touching you. And He said, No. No, someone specific has sought me out. Virtue's gone out of me. And you remember, He touched, he touched her and He healed her. Why? He said, As, as thy faith be, be it unto thee. Jesus was sensitive. He noticed. He touched a leper. That was an unthinkable act to the Jewish mind. And then he do this. He, he secured a public profession, a, 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 a true change. I think about the blind man in John chapter 9. He spoke about that blind man and his faith. I think about that Samaritan leper in Luke chapter 17. They confessed Christ publicly. They confessed the change that was taking place. Christ Himself, John was a witness. Christ was a witness. But let me think about, let me take you back to Matthew chapter 4 and talk about the fact that Christ trained 
you and I to be witnesses. Christ trained you and I to be witnesses. How did he do it? Well, he gave us a picture here with these disciples in Matthew chapter 4. It's not the only place. It's one of the places in Matthew chapter 4. Verse number 18. Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway, that means immediately, left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two, saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. I want you to think about what verse 19 says. He saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. There's an important part of this verse, and that's the first part. Follow me. You cannot be a fisher of men unless you are following Christ. And if you're not, listen to this, if you're not fishing for men, you are not following Christ. You see how that works? Notice the order. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If we're going to be fishers of men, then we're going to have to be following Christ. The Lord was saying, look, uh, 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 you're used to catching fish, and now... I want you to see that with my help and my enabling, you can catch men. But the only way you can do that is to follow me. You know what we need? We have what we call a follow-up program. Maybe it would be better put this way, a follow-me program. Follow-Jesus program. That's what we really need. If we want to see people discipled, do you know who they need to learn to follow? They need to learn to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. Hey, Paul said, be followers of me. How? As I am of Christ. You follow me as I follow Christ. You know, you and I have the same responsibility. We have the same responsibility to follow Christ, and therefore we can train others to follow Christ. But if we're not following Christ, we ought not ever think that anybody else is going to follow Christ. From our life, follow me. Jesus said. I wonder how many we could enlist, how many we could enlist this morning to be in the follow me, Jesus, that is, program. I want you to think about this too. Fourthly, Christ commanded His followers to witness. Christ commanded His followers to witness. Now, I hope you don't walk out here this morning and say, this is just another message that we ought to go soul winning. That's true. And People think this. People think soul winning happens at, on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. That's when soul winning happens. It's not so much I need to go soul winning as I need to be a soul winner. There's a great difference between going soul winning and being a soul winner. Now, I know some people don't like that term. Well, I don't win anybody. I understand that. We understand that it's the Lord doing the winning. But I have... I have the Lord's message, and I'm to be a messenger. I'm to be a mouthpiece for the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. And it's not so much, listen, it's not so much, oh sure, we'd love to have a lot of people out corporately going out at a certain time during the week. Hey, yes, that'd be great. But the important thing is this, the important thing is, am I being a witness wherever I go, whatever I do. Not just, look, say, preacher, do you believe in lifestyle evangelism? I do. I believe you ought to live, you ought to live what you say you believe. You ought to live it. You ought to act that way. Look, I'm a firm believer in this. I believe you ought to be, you ought to, you ought to be the same person at 1225 Robert Fulton Highway that you are, let me just use my address, uh, uh, so at 8 Ivywood Court, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Ought to be the same person. Uh, uh, look, I ought not have a, I have a church life and a home life. I ought to be the same person wherever I'm at. Why? Because I have the same God living inside of me wherever I go. He sees where no one else sees. He knows what no one else knows. God help us. 
Jesus said, teach all nations. How can we, how, how can this, how can this uh, passion for the lost, by the way, can I tell you something? I can stand up here and preach about it, but do you know what's going to have to happen? The Spirit of God is going to have to work in your heart and you catch it. Do you know that a passion for lost, for the lost is really, really it begins, it begins in the heart of God. So if we're going to have a passion for the lost, we're going to have to have a passion for God. Yeah. I, hey, look, I can't love people for just being people. Why? Because I am a person and I'm sinful. And you're a person and you're sinful. And I disappoint people. By the way, you disappoint people. No doubt about it. It must begin, it must begin where God begins. It must begin with prayer. That's where it must begin. Prayer for God to give you a passion for His passion. I wonder if we'd commit to pray for that every day. Lord Jesus, help me to have your heart in this matter of world evangelization. Help me to get your heart in it. I want to give you some things on Saturday evening. I trust you make plans to be there. I have several things I want to give you that will help this way. But it's going to first of all have to begin in your own heart. Then what? Then you know what you ought to do? You ought to study, you ought to study the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. Study His life and ministry. See His love. See His compassion. See His mercy. Study great men and women of history. Read those biographies, as I mentioned at the beginning. But it's going to have to, first of all, begin in your own heart when you catch what God has set out for us to do. Look at 1 John chapter 2. I think we become so preoccupied with everything else in the world that we forget this great task. We forget the fact that one day we shall stand before the Lord Jesus Himself. And pursuing after all the trivial things of this life will, will absolutely be gone. They'll be, they'll be gone. When you strip it all away, it will be, what have you done? What have you done with Jesus Christ? 1 John chapter 2, verse number 6. He that saith he abideth in him, notice, ought himself also so to walk, even as he, that's Jesus, walked. Preoccupy yourself with Christ, with his purpose, with his work. Study scripture. See what, see what the Bible has to say about death. See what the Bible has to say about hell. See what the Bible has to say about judgment. See what the Bible has to say about salvation. Study sin. Study the guilt of sin and the power of sin and the penalty of sin. You'll find out as you say those things that how easily we fall to the prey and the subtleties of this world. It'll help you. It'll help you not to be preoccupied with worldly things. Study sinners. Cultivate a, cultivate a love. Cultivate a sympathy. Hey, look, don't, 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 don't get bitter. Don't get bitter. We're in the election season, right? And things are so polarized. You know what we tend to do? We tend to say, we tend to say, look, look, people who don't agree with me, they're my enemy. Be careful. The enemy is Satan. He's the enemy. Those are people who need the gospel in many respects. They need to hear the truth about Jesus Christ. But if we're not careful, we'll get like, you remember a couple weeks ago, about a month ago, I preached a message about Jonah. We'll get like Jonah. Kill him! Kill him all! That's the way Jonah felt about it. Destroy them all! Careful. You'll live a bitter life that way. You'll live a bitter life that way. You see, when a person comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior, they have a, they have, they, they have a, a great awareness that everyone around them is lost. 
I wonder, have we lost that awareness? You remember when you first got saved? I remember when I got saved, the night I got saved, I've told you this story many times, and how I, I wanted everybody to know. I ran downstairs to tell the family that was gathered there downstairs. Uh, I was in the upstairs part of my grandparents' house. I went around and told all the family members that were gathered there. The next day I went to kindergarten, told everybody in the kindergarten class, everybody I could come in contact with about what Christ had done in my heart. You remember when you got saved? You remember how thrilled you were to tell the people about it? You know the zeal that was there? Is it still there? Or is it gone? You see, all of us are responsible to have a passion for the lost. There's a man by the name of John Harper. John Harper had such a passion. He was called to the Moody Church in the early 1900s. His story came to great attention at the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. Shortly after that great ocean liner hit the iceberg, Harper was leaning against the rail of that ship, pleading with a young man to come to Christ. Uh, four years after the ship's sinking, a young man came forward and said, I am John Harper's last convert. So how did you know that? Well, he told the story. He said, that, sink went, that ship went down and we were there floating in the Atlantic. Harper was floating. And as he was floating in the chilly waters of the Atlantic, he'd float from one person to the next, and he floated by this one young man. As he floated close to that young man, he called out to him. He said, Sir, are you saved? Are you a Christian? He said, No. Harper said, Well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The tide, kind of the waves took him out again, far away from him, and then they brought him back again, close to him. And he got back close to him again, and he hollered again. He said, Sir! Sir, are you saved yet? He said, No. He said, Well, then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Finally, after a while, he saw him no more. He went down into the water. And that young man said, as he as he floated out there in that water in the Atlantic Ocean. God spoke to his heart and he realized his need that he was lost. And he did exactly what Harper said. He said, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Even, even in such a tragic state, such a desperate situation, Harper said, there's a passion there's a passion. Think about all these souls. I wonder how many other people he bobbed back and forth around and hollered out to them. Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if a dying man who knew he was going to die could have such passion. Where is our passion? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In just a moment, we'll have a song of invitation. I want you to sit quietly for just a moment. We won't tarry long, but I want you to think about something. I want you to think about your life. If you know that heaven is your home and Jesus Christ is your Savior this day, you can rejoice in that knowledge. You can rejoice in that truth. How much of your life have you lived? I talked with that young man last Saturday morning. I told him, I said, I'm 35 years old. According to what Moses wrote in Psalm 90, I've reached the halfway point. Where are you at? Preacher, I'm not there yet. Or preacher, I'm well beyond that. Let me ask you this question. What will you do with the rest of your life?
what will you do with the rest of your life? You see, I can't go back and change the past. It's done. All I'm promised of, of course, is right now. And however God sees fit, however long He sees fit to extend my life. What will you give yourself to? What have you given yourself to? And what will you give yourself to? Honestly. You think about all the wonderful things maybe you've been able to do, you've been able to be involved in. Maybe some things you've been able to get, purchase, and have. You think about all those things, all those wonderful things, I can think about things. But there is coming a day when I shall stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. All those things, all those possessions, no more. It's going to be a matter of what I've done for Christ. What kind of a witness have I been? What kind of passion do you have? Look, I don't want to walk out of here. I don't want to leave out of here and be the same, just be the same old thing all over again. That's not how I want to live my life, whether it be this service or tonight or Wednesday evening or whatever it is. I want God to give me a renewed zeal, renewed passion, renewed fire. Stir us up. Lord Jesus, God, and direct this invitation. Do the work that you and you alone can do. Help us to freely give of ourselves to thee. God, and direct this invitation, we pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.